so we've been preaching through the book of Mark, and that's where we're going to be this morning. Mark chapter 16, we're going to look at verses 1 through 8, um, but before we, before we get there, if you want to go ahead and turn there, you can. It'll also be on your screen. The main idea for our morning here is that Jesus' resurrection is historically certain and eternally significant. It's eternally significant because in it, he defeated, and we just sang about this, he defeated the power of death and guaranteed the future hope of his people. The future hope of his people. Um, I, was, I was reading an article uh, recently, an Easter article, um, where, where they interviewed uh, th- this guy that, that claims to be an atheist. And, uh, and, and he was asked, what is the bottom line when it comes to Christianity? What's the bottom line? Like, what is, what is the bottom line when it comes to Christianity? And he responded, that's easy. It's the resurrection of Jesus. And he quickly added, if the resurrection is true, then so are a number of other things. Like the fact that there's a God, that Jesus is that God. The Bible is true. Heaven and hell are real. Jesus makes the difference whether you go to one or the other. And so uh, he claims that if, that, if, that if the resurrection is true, then all of these other things must be true. That Christianity stands or falls on the historical bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That we believe that we celebrate, that we wear pastel colors on this day for. <laughs> right? That some of you, that some of you, uh, you know, drag yourselves out of bed and, 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 and show up to, to, to church for and wonder to yourself, wow, you know, this isn't that bad. The music's great. The pastor's bearable. <laughs> I should do this more often. And that, that, that guy in that article is right on all accounts. Right, on all accounts. No resurrection, no resurrection, no hope. Therefore, no Christianity. Right? If, if, if he is right, no resurrection, no hope, no Christianity. 1 Corinthians 15, 17, Paul plainly writes, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. And so the resurrection seals the forgiveness of sins, the, 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 the hope of a Savior. And so in these verses that we're going to read this morning for the next couple of hours, <laughs> that'll wake you up. Mark will note several evidences for the resurrection. Mark's going to note several evidences Re- evidences for the resurrection. We're going we're gonna to hit them with a bird's eye view, okay, uh, of, the, of this most critical issue of the Christian faith. And then I want, I want us to hit kind of three application points. Does that sound good from this text? So let's read Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices, bought spices, excuse me, so that they might go and anoint him. Now, I want, to, I, want to, I want to talk about this for just a moment because there's a lot of confusion about this. There's a lot of confusion about this, okay? Because we have Good Friday when we bury him, right? And then, and then, and then two dark sleeps, which is how we measure time in, in the bush house, right? My, my son Ezra, who's six, and daughter Vera, who's five, right? They, they, they ask when, it, when, when their birthdays are coming, how many dark sleeps? Until, because that's how we measure time. Right? And so there's only two dark sleeps from Good Friday to Easter. Right? This means yes. This means, right? But, 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 we, but we talk about how Jesus was in the grave for three days. Now, just like, just like we talked about the other night, uh, the Jews measured time 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And so the third hour was 9 a.m., the sixth hour was noon, the ninth hour was 3 p.m., right? And, so, and, then, and sometimes that can get confusing if you look at it. Okay, in the same way they measure days, all right. So, Friday, crucified, buried, that's day one. Saturday, silence, day two. Sunday, the morning, they're going to the resurrection, day three, third day. It's like when you get that, when, when, when they advertise that three day vacation, <laughs> it's only two nights. I mean, you can't check in until like 7 p.m. They'll tell you four, but that's a lie, right? And, and, and I mean, you can use all the amenities, but you got to, you got to, anyway, right? Get it? 
Okay? And then you got to check out by like 6 a.m. On the, on, the, on the checkout day, right? They got to they move you out, okay? Um, they got to move you out. And so, and so it can get confusing, right? But, but three days. Now, what's, what's striking about this, and I want, you to, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, Solomon, right? <clears throat> they, on the Saturday, right? On the day between, think, think about the mood of that day. Jesus just been crucified. The things that they've seen, the darkness for three hours that they had experienced. But they woke up with an urgency, with an urgency. The bazaars, all of the, the markets were back open on that Saturday, the day between. All, all, all of those things are, you know, back in business and, and life is moving on for a lot of people. I mean, think about the disciples. They go back to fishing. They went back to what they knew. They went back to what was comfortable. I mean, everybody is getting back to their lives. And these, and these women had gone to get spices to anoint the dead body for burial. But it had already been done. Mary had done it, as we talked about last week, with, with, the, with the jar right? Anointing his head for, for burial. We knew the significance of that. But I wanted you to grab the picture here that life is back in, in business, right? Life is back in business. And, 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 and they went and bought spices so that they might go and anoint him uh, for, for burial, okay? And so that's why they're going to the tomb. Verse, verse 2, and very early on the first day of the week, that third day, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? It's a big stone. And these three ladies are going and they're trying to figure out, right? Some of them, are, some of them were on tracks in this time for burial when they would have a, when they would have a, 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 a tomb. But, um, but, but, but no doubt, no matter how big or how much on tracks, the amount of friction that would have been uh, between this stone and the, and the rock wall would have been significant. And so as they're walking, as they're traveling towards the, towards the tomb, they're thinking, uh, who's going to move that rock for us, Right? Which is a legit question. Verse 4. Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. Verse 5. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were very, excuse me, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He ain't here. That's the North Carolina version of the scripture. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell the disciples and Peter underline that star that, that he is going before you to Galilee. There you'll see him just as he told you. I love that. Just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Now let's back up. Two women, uh, two of the women at the cross saw where Jesus was buried. We see that at the end of Mark chapter 15, verses 42 through 47, that, that, that two of them saw where uh, he was buried. Solomon and Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, had gone on with John uh, to, to, to be comforted. And so they had seen where he was buried, and they had bought spices so that they could go and anoint the body of Jesus. They knew exactly where he was buried, and they wanted to perfume his body in a final act of devotion. And so very early at sunrise on a Sunday morning, they went to the tomb. They were concerned on the way, as we talked about, how they would get to his body. The stone in front of the tomb was very large, as Mark reports. And when they arrived at the tomb, they were met with a surprise. The stone had been rolled away. And they entered the tomb to find an even bigger surprise. They saw a young man dressed in a long white robe. There was no doubt that he was an angel, and of course, they were amazed and alarmed. Fear, wonder, amazement, astonishment, distress, all at once gripped their souls. And this word alarmed is the same word used in chapter 14 to describe the agony of Jesus 
in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, one thing, one thing if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're into research, if you, know, if you know the other Gospels, if you know the Easter story very well, Luke and John, who were much more descriptive in their Gospels, inform us that there were two angels present. Okay? They inform us that there were two angels present. Why is that significant? I'm glad you asked. Because two is the number required in this time to establish a valid witness. But Matthew and Mark, Matthew 28, 5 and Mark here, focus clearly on the one angel, on the spokesman, the one who conversed with the women. Aware of their distress, the angels seek to calm them, seeks to assure them by revealing the greatest surprise of all. Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's been resurrected. He is not here. Come look at the place where they put him. Come look at the place where they put him. Kristen and I got the opportunity uh, um, um, a few years ago uh, to go to Israel and, and to walk where, from, from where uh, Jesus would have been, where the, where the soldiers would have cast lots for his clothes, walk the Via Della Rosa, the, the road of suffering, to where they call Golgotha, and, and, and to see the tomb where they say, and, and, and who knows, right? But it's a tomb, it's a cave, and you walk in, and there's a, there's a doorway with these nice steps that I'm sure weren't there a few thousand years ago. Okay, and you walk in and you, you look to the right and there's a big spotlight kind of like the ones we have right there and there's a big sign on the door that says he's not here, he's risen. And I walked in with Kristen and we looked to the right and there's a, there's a ledge uh, that right there in the stone and, and sure enough, um, he wasn't there. <laughs> and I actually said out loud, nope, he's not in here as did many of the other 200 people that were there with us. It was, like a, it was like a verification, right, that all these things we'd heard for Easter after Easter and church service after church service, that, 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 that you walked in and, yep, he, he's not there. He has been resurrected. He's not here. See the place where they put him. See it for yourself. See it for yourself. James Edwards uh, said, said this, the crucified one says the angel has been raised. The angel invites the women to see the place where they last saw the body of Jesus in chapter 15. The references to the place of his burial and to Jesus as the crucified one are of crucial importance. Why? The women are not directed to a mystical or spiritual experience or some bizarre encounter. They're directed specifically to Jesus who died by a crucifixion they witnessed, was buried in a place that they had seen, and now has been resurrected. The announcement of the gospel is literally the gospel. The good news of Jesus, that he isn't here in the place from which the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is first preached, is the empty tomb that both received and gave up Jesus. Isn't that powerful? That the angel here in the tomb with these women is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. He's not here. He has risen. And the implications of this for these women was that everything, and I want you to picture this, everything that they had heard for the past three years of Jesus proclaiming was true. It was real. He wasn't out of his mind I'm sure that they must have thought, well, we've got plenty of time before that happens. I'm sure they must have thought, I've got, I've got plenty of time to spend with him. And no, no way he's only going to spend three, three years, three and a half years, this side of heaven and active ministry. And go to the cross at 33 no way, I've got plenty of time. But, but the angel here in the tomb proclaims the gospel. He's not here. He has risen. He is who he said he was. The evidence is undeniable. The tomb is empty. And so now these women who had come with these spices had a new assignment, didn't they? No need to anoint a dead body that's no longer there, amen? Amen. 
it's time to start proclaiming the good news of Jesus, the risen Lord and Savior who has left the tomb. And so the angel instructs them to begin with those who had abandoned and denied him and gone back. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there, just as he told you. What a word of grace. What a word of forgiveness. What a word of hope and promise. What a pledge for a new beginning. Peter would especially be grateful for this word. Stunned, we'll get to that more in just a moment. Stunned, the women started running from the tomb. Look back at verse 8. They went out, fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. I want you to, I want you to put yourself in their shoes. It's like, it's like the person that calls you to give you some news. No doubt like some distressful news. And the first thing they say is what? Don't panic. What do you do? What's going on? What's going on? And so for the angel to, to look at them and say, don't be alarmed. Right? That's exactly what he's saying. Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus. And these women are there. And two things are happening. They've got a guy in a white robe that's telling them not to be afraid. And the body that they're looking for they, and that they brought spices for isn't there. And so they're alarmed. And so when it says that they, uh, so, so I just want you to get that picture because when it says in verse 8 that they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. Granted, they had been given instructions. They had been given a new assignment. They were no longer going to anoint and spice the body. They were to go and tell the disciples and Peter that he was risen and that he needed to get to Galilee. But they, were, they must have been filled with anticipation because Jesus was who he said he was. And so they were excited. And so all of the implications of that. But, but, but also fear because how is everyone going to respond? I'm sure as they were running, they were sitting there thinking, drawing straws. All right, who's, who's going who's gonna to be the one to convince Thomas? The doubter. Who would eventually look at Jesus and say, I'm not going to believe until I stick my hands in the, in the holes where the nails were. And so Mary, Mary, mother of Jesus, you get Thomas because he'll, he'll, he'll believe you, Right? They were overcome with trembling and astonishment. They said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. A guy by the name of Sinclair Ferguson puts this into perspective. He said, should they, should they not have returned home rejoicing in the news that they heard? Is there not something unexpected about this response that in itself is a mark of its authenticity? That if we were to invent the story, we would not end it in this way. But it is more, in Mark's gospel, this fear is always man's response to the breaking in of the power of God. Amen. That what is happening doesn't make sense. Doesn't add up. And thus, Mark's gospel comes to an end. Now, I, I know what you're thinking, but, but pastor, in my Bible, there's 9 through 20. Let me address that very quickly. Verses 9 through 20 are not found in the oldest and most reliable manuscripts, even though right here in my Bible that I would say uh, is, is trusted, uh, it is there. Mark's sudden ending, though, as many, as many uh, uh, scholars write, is what he would have wanted. Mark was to the point. We've talked about that all through this series over the last 16 weeks as we've looked into Mark and him giving, I mean, even him mentioning uh, only one angel here shows that, that he was just going to give you the important. And the, the, the angel that was there to speak was the one that mattered, and so there was another angel there, but he was just there to validate the story, but you don't, you don't need all those details, right? I'm just going to shoot straight to the point. And some of you detail folks are like, no, I love Luke. Dr. Luke, he's so thorough, right? He's so thorough. But I also believe that's why we get four Gospels. 
Mark's gospel makes it clear that the disciples of Jesus were stunned by all of this. They didn't expect the resurrection. They didn't know how to respond. And my question for you this morning is how, how will you respond to the resurrection of Jesus? Because the resurrection verifies the truthfulness of the deity, the godness of Jesus. And provides, like we've already talked about, hope for us. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus just validated that on the cross. Validated that by going into the tomb. Validated that yet again by raising from the dead. And the resurrection tells us that God, who raised Jesus from the dead, exists. That He exists. It establishes the lordship of Jesus, his authority. His authority. The resurrection, as we again sang about this morning, promises victory over death. It's a pledge of God's final judgment. Jesus is indeed the risen Lord. You can reject him, but you can't ignore him. You can reject that he exists. You can reject the truth of it and say, I've got more time. But you can't ignore Jesus. What Jesus did in rising from the dead demands a response. And so again, how do you respond today to the risen Lord and the King of the universe? It's a question that can't be avoided. It's a question that can't be avoided. I feel like I, I'm on a, all right, pause. I'm going to go off notes for a second, okay? I'm on a, I'm on a group chat with a, with a group of pastors that I'm a part of, and, uh, and we, we've, been, we've been texting each other this week. And this morning, um, this morning, one of the pastors asked, how's everybody feeling? And it was after I was here, it was after I'd had half a cup of coffee, right? I was, I was, I was you know, I'm, I'm here, the band's warming up, and I'm back in, in, my little, in my little bird's nest, right? Just, just, just kind of getting my heart ready and, 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 and complaining to, to God about having to tuck my shirt in and, you know, all, all, these, different, all these different things. And, and, uh, and, and, um, but, 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 but a couple of you told me I looked good, so it's worth it, okay? All right, um, and, and, uh, and, and so the text came through, how's everybody feeling? And I went through and found a GIF. Now, now true Patriots fans, you're not going to appreciate this, okay? But I found the GIF of Tom Brady, right? Y'all remember him? He's, a, he's kind of a washed up football player from years ago. Right, but uh, but 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 where he where he's like running into the end zone, he's like, "Let's go!" Everybody hear that, or you want me to do it again? <laughs> right? Because the resurrection of Jesus demands a response, and the response ought to be for those that are that are Christians this morning. That there is no place I would rather be than a group of believers that are united in the fact that we serve a risen, living, authoritative Lord named Jesus Amen. who died for the sins of all. Amen. Not a few. All that loved me enough to go to the cross and pay a debt I couldn't pay so that I could have life, so that I could have joy, so that I could have peace, no matter what, no matter what the circumstances look like. No matter what 2020, 2021, 2022, because let's just lump them all together. It feels like it's just been one horrible week, right? And let's just lump them all together, right? And, and no matter what they've brought, the blessings, the, the, the hardships, all of those things, let's, let's, it doesn't matter. His love for you, His love for me hasn't changed. Let's go! And if that doesn't excite you to be in the house of the Lord this morning, your skin's too tight. Loosen your belt. Because that is why we're here. It's why we're here. 
So three things just for you. The first one is this. The first one is this. That we see right from this text. The first we see is the angel says, do not be alarmed. Do not be alarmed. What the angel is stirring here, and what I want to stir in you, is this one word. Okay, so there's going to be one word with each of these, with each of these quotes from our text this morning. Trust. The angel of the Lord looks at these women and says, "Don't be alarmed. He's risen. He's not here." And if I was one of those ladies in the tomb, I'd be like, "Well, duh. I see that, right?" But that wasn't, the, that wasn't the point. We don't get a lot of conversation because, again, I think they were in amazement. They were in amazement of the fact that he wasn't there because it was the implication that, that, that everything he had said up until this point, like they didn't believe it, but everything, it was true. It was verified. It was validated. Don't be alarmed. Trust him. I believe this is just as true for you and me today as it was for these ladies in the tomb do not be alarmed. Trust Him. Trust Him. Trust Him. There are often obstacles in our lives that seem insurmountable. Amen? From where we are on the path of life. But faith is trusting in God that He will be faithful to His Word and bring about His holy will. Our job is to be faithful and obedient and leave the rest to Him. And leave the rest to Him. Good days, bad days, and everything in between. Trust that God is in control. Trust that God is in control. Do not be alarmed. The second thing. The angel looks at the ladies and Verses 7, but go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell his disciples and Peter. This is significant. Because the angel uses Peter's name. Why did the angel use Peter's name? That's grace. That's grace. Now, we define grace. You, you, you can take a couple of different things, right? Grace is unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. That's, that's, the, that's probably the truest definition. Uh, Rick Warren came up with a, an acrostic for it. I don't know if Rick Warren came up with it, but he started it. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. It's grace. The fact that the angel says, go tell the disciples and Peter was, was God through the angel showing grace to Peter. He wanted to make sure that Peter went and met Jesus. Can you imagine? I mean, think about where Peter is. The shame, the shame that he was dealing with after denying Jesus 48 hours, 60 hours beforehand, gone back to the boat to fish, we see in other gospel accounts that, that he was fishing again, yet again, which goes back to the moment that Jesus called him the first time, wasn't catching anything, and he heard a voice inside saying, cast the nets on the other side, and he catches. And so he had to be thinking, whoa, this is familiar. But go tell the disciples and Peter. And then we see Jesus restore Peter once Peter shows up. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Three times for the three times that he denied him. And you know what's even more miraculous about that story, the Peter story, that if you do a deep dive into Peter's life, and you don't have to go too deep, but if you, if you turn a few pages over into the book of Acts, when we see in Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascends into heaven. Who's the one that preaches the first sermon post-ascension post to the church? Peter. It's Peter. So my question for you is this morning, have you ever felt worthless? 
Have you ever felt like God can't use you? Has the shame, regret, bitterness, brokenness, the lies of the enemy gotten to you and said, you know what? You, there's no way God could use you. Look at the life of Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. And so our word here is grace. God chooses the weak. Overwhelmed most by their sorrow. They are to be the first in joy. And then lastly, we see the response of the ladies in verse 8. And they went. And they went. And they went. Our word here this morning is obedience. The angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you're going to see him just as he told you. Right? Gospel proclaimed. Go tell the disciples of Peter he's risen. He's not here. And he's going to meet you in Galilee just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and obey the things he commanded. Deuteronomy. And obey the things He commands you. These ladies went out in obedience and they went. And they went. And they went. And so, for you this morning, as the worship team is going to come, come on guys, because I'm almost done. Seriously. <laughs> Hurry up. Sometimes I wish we had Jeopardy music to play while they're coming up. <laughs> hey, Tim, come on right up here, bud. Come on right up here. Come on. I like that guy. <laughs> Which one's the hardest for you? Which one's the hardest for you? Which one's the hardest for you to embrace this morning? Do not be alarmed to trust the Lordship of Christ, to trust that He's got a plan in this, to trust that, that, even, that even in the darkest of days, He's in control, to, to trust His plan, to trust His authority. Maybe, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you say, no, the, the and Peter is the hardest one for me. There's no way God can use me. You don't, you don't know my story. You just, you, there's, there's, there's no way. There's no way that I could be welcomed into the kingdom. There's no way I could be welcomed into the family of God. If you truly knew who I was, you wouldn't even let me sit in this building. If you truly knew who I was, you, you, would, you wouldn't let me in here. Even the, even, the, even the couple times you see me. There's no way that God's grace could cover this life. Or the obedience piece. Listen, Travis, I get it. Right? I get it. Do the things that God asks me to do. But I can't give up these things that make me feel so comfortable. I can't give up this life that I've built for myself. And I'm, and I'm afraid, I'm afraid that if I obey the things you're talking about, I'm afraid that if I give my life to Jesus, I'm afraid that if I sell it all, figuratively, maybe literally, but if I give it all up, what's the implications of that? And so I struggle with obedience. You can't deny the resurrection of Jesus and the fact that He is real. That He loves you. That He cares about you. And it demands a response. And my challenge to you today is to respond. To respond in trust. 
to respond in embracing the grace that He's offering you and to respond in obedience. How will you respond? How will you respond? He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. That's the most beautiful part of this weekend. The thought of the upper room on Thursday, the crucifixion on Friday, the silence of yesterday, and the resurrection of today that He came, John 20, 21. Many other signs and wonders were done that are not written in this book, but these are written that you may have life and have it to the full. And so the reason we show up here today is to preach a message of life that is available to you if you will respond to Jesus and say, here I am. Here I am. Here I am. I'm yours. I trust you. Forgive me. Forgive me. And I'll go wherever you send me. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. I will choose obedience over comfort every time. Would you respond in that way this morning? Will you respond in that way tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday? I will. And I hope you'll join me. Let's pray. God, what a... What a message. What a story we get to tell. Magnificent. Grace-filled story. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us to offer us hope and life. And my prayer for us this morning is that we would respond in pursuing you. In pursuing you. And saying yes to you. And submitting our lives in obedience and responding to the grace and the love that you've offered us and trusting on the good days the not so good days and the in between days that no matter what you're sovereign you're in control and you've got a plan for this and so God I pray that you'd move in our hearts and that today wouldn't just be another Easter but that today you would stir something in us a milestone day where we look back and say that Easter 2022 that was when I trusted him that was when I embraced his grace that was when I chose to be obedient in Jesus name I pray amen